What's up guys? Now today I want to talk to you about something that I found out about myself. And the fact is that I am wearing this non-elite Kofuzi Path Projects collab t-shirt for an actual reason today, not just because I felt like putting it on. But what I found out about myself today was that I am not an elite athlete. Please at least feign some surprise for that revelation. But up until this point, I was able to delude myself into thinking I may be an elite athlete by drawing from other criteria. Maybe just a sense of wanting to think of myself as an elite athlete. Let me think that way. And really, I was justified because there was no set criteria as to what made an elite athlete. Now, if you're anything like me, you've probably heard the words elite and sub-elite thrown around with abandon. But that ends today, my friends. Well, actually, it probably ended months or years ago, depending on whenever these scientists got together and they started researching this topic. But I just found out about today. So for me, it ends today. I now know what an elite athlete is. So I am talking about a new study published in the International Journal of Sports Physiology. And the study is titled Defining Training and Performance Caliber colon, a participant classification framework. Kind of a mouthful, but that's okay. So this study was the culminated work of prominent sports scientists from Australia, Canada, Spain, the UK, and they all got together because in the scientific community, there is also the word elite thrown around without really having any specific meaning. So in their study, they decided to get a whole bunch of data and find out within the global population who falls into certain criteria. And they came up with a framework and that framework fits running, but the framework was for all sports. It can be adapted to fit all different sports. Now we're gonna keep this running related because you and I are runners, or at least I assume you are. If you're watching this, I assume you're a runner. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be talking about this elite runners. We're gonna be looking at it from a runner's perspective. Okay, but before we go any further, I didn't just stumble across this study. I came across it from an article in Outside Online and the article was written by Alex Hutchinson. So obviously we know already if it's written by Alex Hutchinson, that guy has his finger on the pulse of everything running sports science related. So he puts this study into very manageable terms. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna provide a link to the Outside Online article by Alex Hutchinson and I'm gonna provide a link to the actual study. Now the study, you don't just get an abstract. This is open for everyone to see. So I'm gonna put the link and you can scroll through and peruse it and it's actually very interesting. Am I overly excited about nerd sports data, maybe. So how we find out about who is better than somebody else and which level they fall into is done by anchoring it in population statistics. So Alex makes it clear that you don't get to elite status by running a certain time or training a certain number of hours. It's based on where you stand compared with everybody else. Here comes the exciting part because I'm gonna give you the tiers. Now there are six tiers. And I guess I'm most looking forward to your comments when you hear about these tiers. And I'm wondering right now if I ruined it for everyone by already telling you that I'm not elite because I hate to say it, but the majority of you watching this, you are also non-elite. Okay, okay, but let's get into it. Tier zero, I, I don't know why they didn't start with tier one, but they start with tier zero, so that's a fine place to start. Actually, it does make sense. Zero is the absolute baseline. The first tier is labeled sedentary and it comprises up to 46% of the global population. So this one is pretty easy. In order to be in tier zero, and remember, the whole global population fits into these tiers. So in order to be in tier zero, all you have to do is not meet the World Health Organization base level of activity. So right now that is 150 minutes of moderate exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise plus a couple of strength exercises throughout the week. So if you don't do that, if you don't do 150 minutes of moderate activity a week, and that could just be walking 30 minutes a day, five days a week. If you don't do that, then you are sedentary. You're at that that base level, most of the world. As long as you meet that WHO guidelines, you're up to tier one, and tier one is labeled recreationally active. And if you meet the criteria for being recreationally active, you are with 35 to 42% of the global population. So basically, to be recreationally active, you are meeting the WHO's guidelines. You might focus on a few different sports or activities, but you're not focused on training and you're not competing in any particular sport. Does that make sense? So again, a vast swath of the population is in this. I would guess that there aren't many any recreational athletes watching this channel right now. So with that said, you, my friend, have graduated to tier two. And tier two is trained or developmental. Now tier two comprises between 12 and 19% of the global population. Now for those of us in tier two, and yes, I, I included myself in that because it turns out I am in tier two. For those of us in tier two, we are, we're focused on a particular sport. Alex identifies it as that you are, you're probably training three or more days a week for the purpose of competing. You might be in a local club, a local running club. You might play for a rec 
back pain. Basically as tier two athletes, we compete in local competitions, which is what most of us do most of the time. And this is an important criteria for us in tier two. There is no performance criteria or skill level required to get here. So up until this point, we have had vast swaths of the population in tier zero and tier one and us in tier two. Those first three tiers really do incorporate a lot of us. And I would say that the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of anyone watching this video is right here in tier two with me. Tier three is where things start getting serious. And if you are in this tier, then you share this space with between 0.01% and 0.03% of the global population. Now tier three is labeled highly trained or national level. So to be in tier three, you are competing on a national level. Now you could also be competing at a state or provincial level, but ultimately, you know, you are, you're getting towards the top of your game, not the top, but towards the top. You could compete for a NCAA division two or three school. And here's an important distinction. You are solely training to improve your sport specific skills. You're not training for fitness. And for sports like ours that are measured in time, you are typically in the top 20% of competitors in your sport in the world. We have finally got to tier number four, and this is elite or international level. So when I tell you about the criteria to be elite, you will quickly realize that I am not in that level. It has now been defined and I'm, I'm not there, but it's a very small group. It's a very elite group, if you will. So the athletes that compete in tier four, they represent 0.0025% of the global population. At this point, you are training as hard as anybody in your whole sport. You might be a division one athlete, you might be representing your country. You are probably thinking about going to the Olympics. And depending on your sport, you are probably ranked between fourth and 300 in the entire world in your sport. Pretty high up there, isn't it? And you are within 7% of the top performances in the entire world. So I know I said that the tier three athletes were reaching the top of their game. Tier four brings it to another level. They are the elite athletes. So finally, we are on to tier five and tier five is just, it's a notch above elite. So tier five is world-class. So you will find that there are fewer than 5,000 athletes in the entire world in this tier five. In fact, there are less than 0.00006% of the global population in tier five. To be in tier five, you are probably already an Olympic medalist or at least a finalist, or you are an all-star in a professional sports team. Your performance in whatever sport you do, so for us, running, your performance is within 2% of the world record or yearly top performance. Even the researchers define these tier five athletes as the cream of the crop. So I think I already know the answer, but if you will, write me a comment, which tier are you in? Perhaps you used to be in a different tier than you are in now. If that was the case, let me know in the comments. And by that, I mean, if you were in a higher tier than you are right now, that's what I want to know about. Obviously, we were all in a lower tier at some point before we started doing what we do. And also, I want to know if you have designs on becoming an elite athlete. Do we have anyone watching that thinks they can reach, well, let's just say the next tier? Guys, my name is Matt. Thanks for spending your time watching this video. I'm sure, just like me, you have discovered that you are, you're not an elite athlete. And that's okay. Us athletes that are not elite, there are a lot of us out there. Does that make us the best? I could argue for that. Be kind, be happy, run well. See you in a couple of days.